Welcome back to Good Law, Bad Law. My guest on today's episode, Henry Hecht, who is a lecturer at Berkeley Law, the University of California, and was the youngest hire on the Watergate Special Prosecution Force 45 years ago. We are talking about Watergate. In fact, we're taking a pretty deep dive into the comparisons between the Watergate experience of 45 years ago and all things impeachment that are going on today from the congressional hearings, the politics, the media, uh, the law, the role of the Supreme Court. There are so many points of comparison, similarities, differences, and precedents that were set four and a half decades ago. It's a great conversation, and Henry has some pretty special and fascinating uh, recollections of his time working on the Watergate prosecution team. So you don't want to miss a minute of this great episode with Henry Heck. Stay tuned. This week, once again, all the news is about impeachment. And this week, again, my guest is someone who has a particularly close association with a prior impeachment investigation, Henry Hecht, a, a lecturer at Berkeley Law at the University of California at Berkeley in the Bay Area, Cal uh, California, and for three years a member of the Watergate Special Prosecutor team. That was about 45 years ago for people who are counting. First of all, Henry, thank you so much for being on Good Law, Bad Law. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Well, we talked with uh, your colleague a couple of weeks ago, Larry Hammond, who was uh, also uh, on the Watergate special prosecutor staff uh, to get an overview of some of the ways we can understand what is going on with President Trump and this impeachment inquiry, which was just formalized by House vote today, moments before uh, we sat down to talk together, and the experience of what happened during President Nixon's impeachment inquiry. And we did get a really good overview in our conversation with Larry, but uh, you and I spoke and I want and agreed that it's so worthwhile to take an even deeper dive, I think, into some of the similarities and some of the differences to, to better understand uh, what's going on in Washington today. So I appreciate you uh, uh, joining me and, and our listeners to do just that. So Perhaps we could start, Henry, if you would, give us, you know, some of the background on yourself, uh, how you got to uh, Archibald Cox's special prosecutor team, and uh, what are some of the things that you were involved in as part of that effort? Well, let me take those two parts and start with um, the great blessing that I was hired by special prosecutor Cox, who at the time was Professor Cox to me. Um, I um, have uh, told my friends that, in a way, uh, President Nixon unwittingly played a role in my being hired as an assistant Watergate special prosecutor. I was um, about to graduate from Harvard Law School in the spring of 1973, and the office was created in May of 1973 um, after the appointment of Professor Cox as special prosecutor Cox. And I had a job to go work for the Office of Eco Economic Opportunity in the training division of the Legal Services Corporation. And uh, President Nixon, in the spring of 1973, defunded the training division of that office, and I no longer had a job. So in Archibald Cox was appointed in um, mid-May. And I wrote him a letter, and it said, um, I'm a candidate for graduating in June, and I don't have any plans following my graduation. And essentially, I said, I'd love to come work for you. It was a rather naive letter. And um, I, was, I received a call um, on uh, June 15th, a couple weeks after my letter, asking if I'd come in to the office for an interview, and I started work on Monday, June 18th. Um, I really was the baby of the office, uh, 
personal note is that Archibald Cox's secretary, Florence Campbell, uh, when I passed the bar, because I had just left law school, when I passed the bar um, and was notified in the fall of 1973, uh, she bought a cake and they threw a little party for the baby lawyer of the office. So <laughs> right. That's how I came to the office, and I have President Nixon indirectly to thank. Well, and it also goes to show if you don't ask, you never even get a chance. So it was good. It was good that you took a chance to ask Professor Cox uh, for a job. And what uh, what were some of the aspects of the investigation that you had a chance to work on while you were were there? Well, I, I was. Uh, your listeners may know the Plumbers was a unit in the White House, and they named themselves the Plumbers to because they wanted to stop leaks. And President Nixon was very concerned about leaks, um, as ha is the current president. And our office divided into teams or task forces, and I was on our office's plumbers task force. And I spent the first ha half of my three years at the office working on the issue of whether uh, President Nixon had abused the power of his office to have the key investigation was to have a created enemies list by President Nixon. And it was a type list in the days when we had typewriters on paper. Whether he used the power of his office to have his enemies um, audited by the Internal Revenue Service. And we there was ultimately a very lengthy investigation with a great number of witnesses. And um, there were no indictments. And because of grand jury secrecy, I really can't say much more than we investigated it and there were no indictments um, after that investigation. Uh, then moved on to, for the second half of my time, I was part of a three-person trial team. President Nixon had made a gift under a statute that allowed a gift of vice presidential personal papers to be given to the U.S. archives and then to receive a tax deduction. Wait, that, so these were papers from when Nixon was vice president? Yes. So he was, he was going to... So he was going to give a gift of his papers? To the archives. Yeah. If you did a deed of gift and an appraisal of the papers, as would be required with any gift of um, in-kind gift, and there was a small problem with his gift. The statute sunsetted, and his gift, deed of gift was backdated, as we proved at trial, and the appraisal of the papers was backdated. So essentially, it was tried as um, not a tax fraud, but false statements to the government. Nixon was already pardoned. The trial team I was on, we were the last jury trials of the Watergate Special Prosecution Force in the fall of 1975. And um, among the witnesses was um, a woman who was at the archives, an elderly woman, who testified that she remembered the paper appraiser, a gentleman named Newman out of Chicago, because he was a world-famous Lincoln memorabilia uh, appraiser and historian. And she remembered being so excited on a snowy day and their sign-in records at the archives that Mr. Newman came to the archives and she met a lifetime hero, but he backdated his appraisal to fit the sunset of the law. Nixon um, paid essentially no taxes for two years. And then, um, although pardon, um, paid those back taxes, those um, so there were uh, one plea and two jury trials associated with that, and that was um, pretty much a year and a half, including those trials. So, so in other words, even though Nixon had already been pardoned after he resigned, the trial that you're talking about over these papers and the falsified appraisal, or at least the dates being falsified, this really was a trial against the president. Technically not. Um, he was not named in the indictment, and he had been 
pardons all prior um, crimes in September 1974, and the and the deed and deed of trust. I I, I left out. I'm sorry because I'm so used to its own history. Nixon's deputy White House counsel, um, not as famous as John Dean, his White House counsel, co-signed the dean with his personal attorney, Frank DeMarco, not as famous as his law partner of the law firm of Kalmbach and DeMarco. Herb Kalmbach um, was very involved in the campaign contrib- illegal campaign contributions and uh, also the raising of money, the hush money. So Nixon was not named in the indictment. He was not an unindicted co-conspirator. Um, so he was not on trial. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and, and am I right that you... And he, yeah, in go- his, he testified, uh, it's a little less known that uh, pres- no longer President Nixon, former President Nixon testified before the grand jury um, in June of 1974. Um, Again, I'd remind your audience that the I'm so sorry, June 75. of 75. Right, because he resigned. The pardon was in September of 1974. Right. And that, interestingly enough, and it fits um, very much with uh, what's going on currently, uh, the same judge, I believe her name is pronounced Howell, the D.C. Um, District Court judge who has said that Mueller's grand jury materials may be delivered to the House, she also approved the release of Nixon's grand jury testimony from June of 1975, some 36 years later, after a Freedom of Information Act request from a historian. And so I now can publicly say that Nixon denied um, any involvement and knowledge of knowing that anything was backdated. He essentially said, I told my personal counsel to take care of this deed of gift. Wait, so, but, uh, so he was not charged. Right. So nor would he, nor, nor could he have been brought to trial in the fall of 75 on this. Because he had been pardoned already. Yes. Okay. So wait, so this is fascinating. And I, and I, and I love the history of Watergate and I've loved reading so many accounts and books on the subject. So, But this is something I didn't know, that, that Nixon came back after he left office, after he resigned, after he'd been pardoned by President Ford, and actually testified in this case, your case, in front of the grand jury. So you were there, I take it, when former President Nixon gave that grand jury testimony. I did. It's important to add a historical note, and I think it also fits current times, importantly. Um, the appearance before the, uh, it was broadly known as the Watergate Grand Jury. Uh, that appearance was actually at the Western White House, formerly the Western White House in San Clemente, by agreement. And rep- two representatives of the Grand Jury, rather than the full Grand Jury, came for the under oath transcribed testimony. I see. And Nixon's lawyers were present for that testimony, which is not traditional grand jury procedure. You're not entitled to have your attorney come into the room um, when a, your witness is testifying before the grand jury. Hmm. So these so were, it was a, a yeah. by agreement system. Right. Fascinating. And were you the one who got to interrogate the former president? Well, I was part of a trial team. I was one. It was a um, as a um, longer than one day appearance. Um, I don't remember. And uh, we were divided into teams, and there was a, a negotiated agreement about how long each of the groups could question former President Nixon. So I was one of the questioners on the uh, I'll shorten it and call it the uh, um, tax deduction mm-hmm. 
I was one of the questioners, and um, there were also questioners about um, other topics um, where investigations had not been concluded. Well, this is this. I mean, in addition to this being fast, a fascinating background, I think we've already opened the door to one of the similarities between the Watergate experience that I think probably most people don't even appreciate and what is happening currently with with President Trump, which is uh, I think most people think that Watergate was about Watergate. It was about the break in at the Watergate Hotel and it was about the cover up. And what did the president know and when did he know it regarding that cover up? And that's it. All these other issues a couple of a couple of them being the, the work that you were involved in directly during your time on the special Pro- prosecutor staff, and there were others too, uh, other well, issues, I, right? But today, yeah, I think we're, very importantly, yeah. um, there was um, a trial and convictions for the um, after the leak of the Pentagon Papers by Daniel Ellsberg. Um, that's part of the history of the creation of the plumbers unit because those they were released in June of 1971. You have to remember the break-in is actually June of 72 at the Watergate office complex. A year before that, the plumbers, and I'm not talking about my office, I was a, a member of the plumbers task force, the White House plumbers, led by Gordon Liddy and H. Howard Hunt, they broke into the office of Dr. Fielding, the psychiatrist in Beverly Hills, who was seeing Daniel Ellsberg, and they were looking for dirt on Ellsberg. And that was prosecuted um, and um, convictions of a number of high White House officials and uh, um, others that broke in. So, I mean, that's a trial that was a very significant. There were a great number of pleas for illegal corporate campaign contributions. The slush this fund. This is before Citizens United. Right. Um, the enemies list didn't lead to prosecutions, but um, there were investigations about the abuse of power. Um, so Watergate, um, which is actually the first use of the gate, and, you know, since then we've had Russia Gate. In more recent times, but Bridge Gate and um, many other gates, but it was much broader. And our office produced a final report, um, and it spells out in great detail all of the investigations we conducted and the results. So, th- so that is a good point of comparison to what's happening today. And as most people know, um, impeachment is both a political process in the Congress, but there are also very significant legal and constitutional implications, too. And what we're seeing today is the struggle over how limited or broad the scope of the investigations into President Trump's activities ought to be. Should it be narrowly limited to what's what has happened in Ukraine? Should it include uh, the second half of the Mueller investigation, which dealt with obstruction in the Russia gate, you know, the Russian scandal? Uh, should it include issues relating to emoluments, you know, the president's uh, personal profiting from places like his hotels and golf courses and things like that? That's a big issue it, that we're facing currently. And um, you actually, along with 16 of your former colleagues on the Watergate prosecution team co-authored an op-ed in the Washington Post a couple of weeks ago. We talked about this when when Larry Hammond was on the program. And you call for somewhere in between, it seems like. You're, I mean, you're, you're not advocating impeachment based solely on what we know so far about Ukraine activities. You also think that the Mueller obstruction findings are, ought to be included. Is that right? Yeah, we we um, the seventeen of us worked hard to um, have a statement that we all um, could sign, and um, we felt strongly that um, the Ukraine. I'm going to call them the Ukraine allegations for shorthand. 
have dominated the press and the conversation and are currently dominating the reported stories because we don't know if there's been other witnesses on other matters. Um, but uh, we said that um, on its face, part two of Mueller's investigation uh, listed 10 acts that could be considered obstruction of justice. And then, then it was left to Attorney General Barr to decide whether that was would proceed. But um, because the definition of high crimes and misdemeanors in the Constitution is not defined, and as you so well said, that there, it's a political process also, um, we thought that um, that should be included. Um, we also thought and um, felt very strongly, and there's parallels to the Nixon period with the White House tapes and the refusal to turn them over initially until ultimately um, the Supreme Court in an 8-0 decision in U.S. versus Nixon um, said that um, you can't use a claim of executive privilege as a as a means to refuse to turn over evidence. There's a balancing act. Uh, we we felt strongly that that was a matter that the current blank, blanket refusal, or, or at least request, uh, let me split it into two parts, uh, a refusal to turn over documents, but also, um, and, and some government employees have not followed it, um, the president asking no one to testify before Congress um, was a, an, a contempt in an, of a co-equal branch of government. Um, so I think those are the the three major ones um, that, so, that so we suggested were worthy of inquiry. So the Ukraine allegations, number one, number two, the obstruction, act, the obstruction of justice acts relating to the Mueller Russia investigation, and third, of what really is a variety of obstruction like activities non-cooperation, instructing witnesses not to cooperate, not to provide documents to the House Committee yeah, conducting I, these investigations. Know, it, I know you're a practicing lawyer, so there's different ways to count things, but those are the, the three major ones, and mm -hmm. the, the last refusals have these subparts of whether it's persons or documents or yeah. cooperation in any other manner. Well, and I mean, talk about that a little bit, Henry, because it, it we... We look at the House vote today, it was on mostly, except for a couple of exceptions, strictly partisan political lines, this vote to authorize a now formal and soon public uh, a aspect to the impeachment investigation. Um, I think people don't realize probably that there were some ways in which Watergate was also quite partisan, although there were other ways in which it was bipartisan and ultimately uh, had to become bipartisan in order to force Nixon to re to realize that he had to resign. Um, yeah, but I, I think it's, um, it's well reported that in after the release of 60 tapes and, and, um, and the famous referrals to smoking guns and the 18 minute and a half gap and, and and the hearings that have been conducted by the House, uh, senior Republicans um, in the Senate, because they would be the location of the trial, uh, told President Nixon that you will be impeached. And on uh, August 9, you know, he resigned at noon Washington, D.C. time. I, I do think that there's um, at, least two, uh, at least two um differences in what appears to be the Watergate era and how Congress operated and, and current times, even with today's vote. And I want to start with the Senate Select Committee, um, which Sam Irvin headed and, and Senator Baker of Tennessee was um, my um, chief for the minority. And Senator Baker is the, the person who coined um, what did the president know and when did he know it, which has continued to be a term used by many. 
um, for many other investigations, but certainly the current one. I think one um, in 1973, the spring of 73, when the Senate Select Committee started, there was there was both a majority of Democrats in the House and the majority of Democrats in the Senate. Um, but I think it's important to note that the Senate Select Committee um, authorized that there would be the, I'm sorry, the entire Senate authorized in February of 73 before the public hearing started later that spring um, by 77 to zero. So it obviously included some Republicans that the hearings would proceed. Um, the House voted to proceed um, by a vote of 440 to 10 in in February of 74, but the hearings didn't go public until the summer of 74. And I think you and I talked briefly. There were certainly um, investigations and um, whether they were labeled depositions or interviews of witnesses well before the public hearings. Um, ultimately, I think a, a comparison needs to be made between, for example, this, um, the Intelligence, Intelligence Committee um, report in the fall of 2018 as one example, where the um, House Intelligence Committee issued a majority report and a minority report. And no one spoke, as I can recall, um, now coming on 45 plus years ago, no one spoke about tribal loyalty um, and dysfunction in the House and Senate. And I think that that's a significant difference in um, the period in which Watergate happened. Um, I had worked for, before I went to law school, for Senator Charles Mack Mathias of Maryland, a Republican. But he was known as a moderate, and moderate had a meaning that we don't tend to hear anymore about um, Republican senators. It, um, there was Lowell Weicker. There were a number of people on the that were Republicans. Right, right. Well, I, I think that and Howard Baker time. would be another. So, so that is a that is a huge difference, and yet. Uh, it, it you know it strikes me that it's a difference in in the way we talk about things, not necessarily in the way we're doing things. Because as you point out, during Watergate there were uh, there were private or closed door you know sessions where testimony was taken in an interview format or de you know deposition format or statement format. Just as is going on today, that's how lawyers build cases. There's there's absolutely nothing extraordinary about that whatsoever. And, uh, and I know that you lecture and teach lawyers all about depositions. I mean, even in a non-political and a non-impeachment context, we take depositions which are conducted in private, in lawyer conference rooms, before we take testimony of witnesses live in a courtroom during trial. I mean, that's just a, it's just an accepted and standard thing. But we talk about it today or, uh, the, you know, those who are critics of the impeachment process now underway, talk about it in a very partisan way, as if it is something well, extraordinary. I yeah, I think um, in um, 1974, when the impeachment proceedings of Nixon were going forward, and it was a public vote that they, they would proceed, months before the public hearings and the vote of three articles of impeachment, I don't recall anyone referring to the impeachment proceedings and the procedures that were being used as a kangaroo court. Mm -hmm. um, and or I think... Soviet-style um, justice. With that hyperbole? <laughs> yeah. Well, someone today uh, called it Soviet-style justice or Soviet-style hearing. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. other thing, I think, in, as an analogy only, there are those that um, disagree with the grand jury process because it's in secret. Mm hmm Unless the materials are needed for the trial, public use, or approved by a court for release, 
But I, as a former prosecutor, feel very strongly that the grand jury process also protects citizens because it doesn't always lead to charges. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you made public all investigations, um, people's reputations can be harmed and ruined when there's no indictments rendered. So to me, it's an analogy that the idea of um, thorough, careful, initial investigation before publicly having hearings, um, which um, have been called circuses. Um, I, I think there's historical precedent, um, both in the Nixon impeachment and the Clinton impeachment, and I also think there are um, good reasons to have thorough and private investigations. It's important to note um, at the depositions currently being conducted in private, there have been a number uh, conducted, and there are re members of the Republican Party that are congresspersons present. It's not only Democrats running a private um, and the term witch hunt has been used st starting w w certainly in the, um, as to uh, special counsel Mueller's. It was also that term wasn't used by Nixon, and um, but um, I think that having these um, thorough investigations before public hearings is appropriate and analogous to why we have grand jury proceedings. I don't want to suggest that there aren't critics of grand jury proceedings. Right. Well, right. And, and I mean, you made the point that, again, the process, we're hearing a lot of defenses and attacks of the process, but again, the Republicans not only uh, can participate in these pre-public hearing uh, depositions uh, by attending, if they're on one of the three committees, they can ask questions and they are given equal amount of time to ask questions. And for the most part, they've chosen not to attend the depositions, only to stand outside the door and, and attack the process again, which brings me back to something you said earlier that I find so striking, which is the, the, the we could have seen the undertaking of the impeachment investigations during Watergate as being so highly partisan because the opposing party, the Democrats, controlled both houses of Congress. And yet, in a show of almost unanimous bipartisan agreement, both houses of Congress endorsed proceeding. That's not the same thing as voting for impeachment or convicting on articles of impeachment, but pretty striking the level of bipartisanship in authorizing the the launching of these investigations and all that followed. So how do you compare that to what we're seeing today? Well, I, I want to um, refer back to what um, my 16 colleagues and I said in the opinion piece in the Washington Post, which is, um, we think there are grounds to proceed, and all we were urging is that there be a, and we wrote it, that the House proceed with a process, the impeachment process that was fair, open, and open with, has what we've discussed. It doesn't start on day one open, and promptly because of the, you know, we, we said the three different acts, and that there would be, um, an opportunity for contrary evidence that the president can offer. And it makes it a very difficult process if the president's position is, um, in spite of the Constitution giving the power to the House, it's not legitimate to do so. White House counsel wrote a lengthy letter to the congressional leadership saying, this is just not right to do. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. And um, we're not going to cooperate. And I think that's um, as a matter of the rule of law, which we emphasized in our opinion piece. There are three branches of government. They have distinct roles. Um, 
there's nothing in the Constitution and there's no case that suggests and um, the D.C. District Court judge saying Mueller's materials can be turned over in a, in a I understand, a 75-page opinion, make it clear that the process is appropriate. And there aren't constitutional rules that said you can't even start unless you have a full vote of the House, which we had today. And democracy had a majority that said it shall proceed. Well, you know, I, I'm I'm really deeply concerned about the language. I mean, we talk about it as partisanship or in even grander terms as tribalism in our politics today. But the language matters. And you and I chatted about this before we started the the episode today. As lawyers, we get that. Words do matter and their meanings matter a lot. Moments after the House took the vote that they took today to authorize a formal impeachment proceeding, the White House issued a statement calling it unconstitutional. I mean, it is it is fundamentally constitutional for the House of Representatives to undertake an impeachment inquiry, it, as in it's in the Constitution. But we're we're very free with words now that have particular meaning, and I, you know, I I worry that because people like you and I consider the value of these terms and the value of the documents and the law to ha to have real meaning and the truth of it to to matter i mean where in you know what what are i guess what because i do want to keep the focus on looking back as well as looking at where we are today i mean what lessons from watergate are there do you think in the way we talk about things perhaps richard nixon didn't use the word witch hunt per se but he and, and many of his supporters certainly attacked the process in a variety of ways, in ways similar to what we're seeing today. Well, I hope this is not a Pollyannish view of the Watergate era, but I think it showed that the system worked. The system by which I mean the Constitution and the roles of the three branches of government, the um, Senate. The Congress, both in the form of the Senate, which investigated, and had a huge national audience riveted to the testimony that was public at those hearings, the House, which proceeded with um, it, its investigations and public hearings and voted, there were five articles of impeachment, but only three passed. So it, there was discretion used, um, and the courts played a role. Very significantly, um, I referred earlier to the United States versus Nixon 8-0 decision. The court said, uh, no, uh, Mr. President, as President Nixon, um, you may not assert that no tapes will be turned over because there's a balancing of interest when there's an investigation um, of, of crimes. And those tapes were significant in the prosecutions of not just the break-in, but of other matters. Um, and those tapes are available um, in the Nixon Library, and I think um, maybe at the same time in the U.S. archives, and, there, and transcripts have been produced. Um, they're very hard to hear. They were done in old technology. It's called a reel-to-reel -reel recorder, where there was actually tape. Um, but I think that era shows that um, the system can work. And I want to make a side note, which you didn't raise directly, but I think the attack on the um, FBI and the investigation of the origins of the investigation, it's appropriate to proceed if you want. And Attorney General Barr has made that decision. But I attended a talk by former Attorney General Holder, who pointed out that the attack on the credibility of federal agents uh, is going to have long-term consequences for all law enforcement officers who testify, not just the FBI, when we begin to believe that the, those sworn to be nonpartisan and do their investigations should be considered not trustworthy. And I also think on a related note, the claims of deep state 
by the current administration are very damaging to uh, an intelligence community that's had a um, good reputation. And so I think the current attacks are actually um, much, are, are different than attacks made um, during the Watergate era. Um, interesting enough, the FBI were the investigators on behalf of our office. That's how the Department of Justice works. And they were the same agents who, after the Saturday Night Massacre, put crime tape, not that there was a crime, but to seal our office. Because initially, Professor Cox, Special Prosecutor Cox, was fired, and the Washington Post ran a headline that our office was closed. In fact, no one was fired other than Professor Cox, the Special Prosecutor, and then Leon Jaworski succeeded him as the second Special Prosecutor. So um, there were attacks on the investigatory work of the FBI um, in the Watergate era. Right. So so we, when we look back, I mean, President Nixon's conduct was so flagrant. I mean, his crimes, as we, we now understand them, uh, with the benefit of all the work that the special prosecutors did and historians and journalists and, and uh, others in... in bringing out all the details of what actually did happen. Uh, Nixon's conduct was so flagrant and, and so shocking at the time that a president would, would flaunt uh, his disregard for the rule of law and the Constitution and uh, separation of powers. But the other institutions around him, again, I mean, to highlight the bipartisanship in, in both houses of Congress, the role of the Supreme Court, uh, which very rarely rules unanimous, unanimously on any issue, uh, but here one of the most important decisions in in our country's history in the middle of all of this. Are you concerned about the uh, the solidity of our institutions in in the current climate? Because it's it's both the attacks on those institutions and it's the I think, too, some of the undermining conduct of some of the people that are, have been in those institutions, too. I mean, uh, former FBI Director Comey has been criticized by both sides, depending on who he's you know, standing in front of a bank of microphones to talk about. Um, so so maybe it's, it, it, it's some of both. But are you concerned about the integrity and solidity of our institutions to, to carry us through this process? Uh, well, I, I'll uh, remain hopeful that um, the arc of justice, which is to very poorly paraphrase um, Dr. King, that the arc of justice and uh, um, process will um, bring us through this. I, I am concerned, and I'm very concerned about the long-term impact on the um, agencies of government that are really being undermined. I think there's another piece that's um, uh, different today that's important um, that relates to this um, attack on institutions. Um, President Nixon referred to the press um, as his as his enemy. And President Trump has referred to the press as the enemy of the people. And whereas in the Nixon era, there were attacks on the accuracy of the reporting, the phrase fake news is a phrase of the Trump era, as best I know. Uh, and I think the attack on the press, which has a role uh, to be played, it's been called the fourth estate, is, an, is a, also um, a concerning piece. Um, it relates to how different, I think, um, you didn't explicitly ask this, uh, the, the current era is from the Watergate era. And that is the nature of media. So if you think back to um, 1972, that was the Watergate break-in. There were three broadcast channels, commercial broadcast channels, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And there was one public and really a fledgling station, PBS. And now, 
as we all know, there's a there are there remain broadcast channels, but there are cable channels, and significantly, um, to pick only one, there's um, Fox News, and I think there's another important historical point about um, the the media and Fox News when the 1949 doctrine uh, by the Federal Communications Commission of the the Fairness Doctrine, which required licensed broadcasters to present controversial views. Um, I'm always paraphrasing these regulations and statutes. Um, In an honest, equitable, and balanced way, when the FCC in 1987 ended that fairness doctrine, we have seen that um, there is not a balanced presentation by a variety of media. It's not required. And I, I don't want to leave it only to Fox News. They're also certainly liberally aligned. Um, and I think that's an important difference, that when you start out with what brought it to mind is an allegation of fake news, and then only give credibility to those that support your view, that's a problem. Um, social media, I think, is a huge problem. Right. And that's Twitter amplified just everything. just announced, yep. I believe, yesterday through Jack Dorsey that they wouldn't be taking paid political ads. Um, and Facebook, through Mark Zuckerberg, has said, you know, we, we don't want to be the arbiters of the First Amendment, so we will take content without... Vetting. But they're getting a lot of criticism for that, and Zuckerberg was in Congress think, to talking about that issue. I think we'll have to see where it goes. So social media. I looked it up this morning before we talked. President Trump has 66.4 million Twitter followers, and I had given uh, had a conversation with others just uh, one month ago, and he's gained 2 million followers in one month. And that's a platform um, that we didn't have, and it's limited in the number of characters. So it's we don't we get sound bites, and no one can fact check what people say as quickly as they can put it up. And it's twenty four seven; it's all the time. And you're right that that number sixty six million is important. I mean, that's a roundabout the number of votes a president needs to win the popular vote. So if he can keep talking to his 66 million, uh, he's probably got some Twitter followers who are not particularly strong fans of his, but if you, if you feel that many of them are, most of them are, he's got a direct uh, connection to all those people and can pretty much say anything he wants, just like anybody can on Twitter. Yeah, and I, I, I apologize for repeating, but I think it's significant that one can say something in a limited number of characters. And I only referred to his 66 million, but you can repost and share through social media. So there's far more than 66 million that see things that um, are limited in the number of words used and can be inflammatory. Well, so what's what? What is you? You've now said that a couple. What is your point about the limited number of characters? Are you concerned about oh, the well, lack of truth, the lack of nuance, the lack of accuracy? Well, there's not much. Uh, you said it as well as I could. Uh, I have my own, my concerns about whether it's truthful and can be checked, but um, there's there's no nuance. There's no discussion. And uh, obviously, I'm a little naive to think that one might also put out um, opposing views when they make statements. Um, certainly, um, we see all the time in um, the New York Times as an example that when it puts out a story, not only um, does it refer to the work it did to publish the story, but it always seeks comments by. Um, anyone about whom the story has been written. So this um, short attention span of Twitter has um, 
no context, no nuance, and no added information. But it's it's a bit ironic, isn't it? I mean, we when you compare it to the Watergate era, yes, of course, there were fewer uh, media outlets. Uh, people read newspapers more for news, actual newspapers with journalists who wrote on actual typewriters, as I did at the beginning of my career. Uh, and and now, of course, the internet, social media, cable. Um, Anybody with an internet connection in their basement can become a publisher, uh, and and it doesn't matter. Uh, there there are no necessary standards for accuracy or fairness, or balance or nuance or anything. Um, so that's ironic in a sense, isn't it? That we people have more access in more widely varied ways to information, but it seems it's harder to get true information. It's harder to get the truth in these times. I, I agree. <laughs> well, I have hopes for that myself. So uh, what about uh, one thing I was thinking about uh, that I wanted to make sure to ask you about, because we, we were talking about the Mueller investigation earlier. And of course, one of the articles of impeachment brought against Richard Nixon was obstruction of justice. And uh, certainly, President Trump's conduct in the that's described in the second half of the Mueller report is all about obstruction of justice, and a lot of the conduct that we're talking about in terms of Ukraine and this impeachment inquiry and whether the president will allow witnesses to testify or documents to be produced and so on is also really about obstruction of justice. So, so obviously, obstruction is a huge, huge part of both. Watergate and what we're uh, seeing unfold today. Um, one of the defenses that I've heard some uh, conservative pundits offer of the uh, Mueller investigation's findings relating to obstruction is that he didn't actually obstruct, that President Trump didn't actually succeed in obstructing, witness the fact that Mueller was able to complete his investigation and produce a report that uh, that all can see. Uh, I I find that very confusing and I and I and I think actually misleading because it it's sort of it's not like there's attempted murder and actual murder. I mean there's obstruction of justice plain and simple, I think, but you are more the expert and I wanted to make sure to to see what you thought of that and and maybe that's at least one thing that we can clear up for people is there continuing to follow along with what's going on. Well, you know, there are elements of crimes, and I'm not um, actually an expert on the elements of obstruction of justice. What I can say is that there were 10 acts that were enumerated, and whether they're successful um, is not the, the ultimate trial standard or the the standard of proof whether they're ultimately successful. And I think one of the confusions is whether it's a crime about intent, but there were overt acts in furtherance of um, an attempt to obstruct. And I'm not a criminal law specialist, and um, the matters I worked on were on that um, that that particular crime, but I, I think it's very important to note that, as we, we spoke about earlier, high crimes and misdemeanors are not defined um, in the Constitution, and in fact, um, many scholars over many years have been writing, and Professor Lawrence Tribe, um, very famous constitutional law scholar at Harvard, just published. Um, a book um, on, entitled To End the Presidency, The Power of Impeachment. I have not read it, but thanks to the miracles of online ordering, I have ordered it. And when I say just published, it was published in 2018. Um, there are any number of people writing about the process of impeachment, um, which um, we've talked to you and I a bit today but also um, what is an impeachable offense. And I think it's very important to 
to note that the standard for conviction for obstruction of justice, of which um, Halderman and Ehrlichman, um, Mitchell, and a number of others were convicted in the Watergate. We, we used to call it the conspiracy case. The public would call it the break-in case. They were convicted of obstruction of justice, and the impeachment standard is about high crimes and misdemeanors, and that has to do with the failure, again, I'm paraphrasing, to follow your oath of office and to um, faithfully execute the law. Faithfully, not, thank you. Right? Not abuse the power of your office. Yeah, um, and so I, I, yeah. I just think that I, I would think oh, if it hasn't already happened that we're also going to hear the claim um, in addition to that it's a Soviet-style process or a kangaroo court that um, there'll, there'll be a... Rev you know, you and I talked about the three major themes that my 16 colleagues and I pointed out that... Um, going back to obstruction of justice is wholly inappropriate because the Department of Justice refused to bring criminal charges. And it shouldn't be a parallel standard that if charges are not brought, it's not a high crime and misdemeanor. I'm not prejudging, and I think it's very important. I, I said it earlier, but I want to repeat that our office, in its very first paragraph, said unless disproved by contrary evidence that the president may choose to offer. So um, it's a process. We believe in a fair process, which is um, there's investigations and there's allegations made, um, and the uh, party charge gets to counter those allegations. There, and there are facts, and there is evidence, and there is testimony, sworn testimony. I mean, all of those things have to fully come out, and the public now is going to get a chance to see a lot of that evidence and, and watch a lot of that testimony as these hearings uh, move towards a televised format. So, yeah, we it's people are forming impressions and lining up behind their, their R or their D, but, but, but there's a lot more to come. And the, and the process is, is just going to have to unfold. It has to. Yeah, I, I do think to refer back to our conversation about the nature of the media and the 24-7 cycle, um, it's not going to be the same as um, that image in the um, late, in the summer of 73 and the summer of 74, a year later, of a large number of people glued during the daytime to live hearings. I don't think, my prediction is we're not going to, because there's so many competing diversions in our lives, I don't know that they'll have that same feel. And uh, a side note is uh, when we were working in our office during these public hearings, many of us were busy working and not trying to watch a little um, rabbit ear television. Um, but at night, when PBS, which is how McNeil Lair and the News Hour got its fame, rebroadcast the hearings, we would watch, work all day, watch all night. But there were many, uh, there's data out about the percentage of, of the American populace looking, listening to those hearings. And that was part of, you made reference, and I did earlier, to the public support over time, growing public sentiment. Um, those Republicans both had, uh, senators, had tapes and testimony under oath, but they also had their constituents um, telling them that this was, a, to put it mildly, a problem that um, you Republican senators need to acknowledge. Well, also, when not only was the world of the media different and the times different in the 70s, but there hadn't been an impeachment since the Civil War. And many, many people now have lived through Watergate and subsequently uh, the Clinton impeachment and now this. So it's 
It's extraordinary in many, many ways, I think, unprecedented the extent to which we've seen, um, you know, fl flouting of uh, the power of the president's office. But uh, perhaps to some, this is this is the third impeachment they've lived through and combine that with, uh, you know, the nature of 24 seven news cycles. And uh, yeah, you're right. I wonder how many people are going to tune in? I hope I hope everyone does. You know, it's interesting. Um, you referred to the third impeachment people have lived through. I couldn't do the statistics on uh, the, the age demographics of the United States citizenry, but I can tell you that until very recent times, when I would teach my law students at Berkeley Law, references to Watergate would only have um, glazed over eyes. It was not for my average age, 26-year-old Berkeley law students. Yeah. It was both nothing they had ever seen, but not um, seemingly uh, relevant to their everyday life. Well, on that note, Henry, I want to encourage people who who didn't live through Watergate personally, as 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 I did, and and as you much more intimately did. Uh, to tune into this episode, listen all the way through, because there are a lot of fascinating uh, similarities and differences and historical precedents precedence that uh, that we have uh, from the Watergate times to understand uh, the times we're in right now. So uh, thank you for that, Henry. Thank you for, for being on the podcast. Thank you for your time and uh, in your service and for sharing your perspective today. You're most welcome, and thank you for your thoughtful questions. It's great. Thanks very much. <laughs>